Good evening. My name is Dr. Linda Helmick. I'm a clinical psychologist at KSB, and I'm here as part of KSB's Brain Health series. I'm going to speak this evening on post-traumatic stress disorder. The title of the program is When Past is Present, Understanding and Healing from Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. I'm going to begin with giving you some information about what post-traumatic stress disorder is, how it happens, talk a little bit about the theories of uh, how we understand, and from those theories, how we try to treat post-traumatic stress disorder, and at the end, give you some resources that you can use um, if this is something that you want more information about. So first of all, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a psychiatric diagnosis that has been applied um, to individuals who've experienced something traumatic. It used to be that people believed only um, it only applied to veterans. So when they were not in the military or didn't have a combat background and somebody said they had post-traumatic stress disorder, they found that uh, difficult to believe. But in fact, it is something that can be applied to anybody who's gone through something traumatic. So post-traumatic stress disorder requires that an individual have been exposed to something traumatic. It could be a single incident um, of an actual or a threatened death, such as a serious injury or a car accident. It could be a sexual violence or witnessing something traumatic to somebody else. Um, could be a natural disaster um, that you've been exposed to or you've survived. Um, sometimes the traumatic events are long-term, like um, all the consequences or events that happen in a war. But again, sometimes it's just one serious event that was significant enough um, that made the individual who experienced it feel um, significantly threatened and often threatened with death. Um, you can be, you can develop post-traumatic stress disorder from being exposed through a second hand through somebody else who's experienced something really difficult. So if you have a loved one who um, was in a traumatic event or had something traumatic happen to them, the knowledge of what they went through can also create some post-traumatic stress disorder in yourself. Um, the um, exposure to these events often creates very, very strong feelings of fear or horror or helplessness, sometimes guilt. Um, and people who develop post-traumatic stress disorder tend to exhibit a characteristic pattern of symptoms and behaviors. It is that pattern that helps us to make that diagnosis. And um, it's those pattern and symptoms of behaviors and thoughts and feelings that guide the treatments that we use when we're working with somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the clinical presentation of PTSD, it's the short term for post-traumatic stress disorder, it kind of varies by patient. So the way that you present might be different if you're a child than if you're an adult. It might be different if you're a male or a female. Um, the presentation sometimes is different by the kind of trauma that you experienced and the personal history of the individual who experienced that kind of trauma. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So what are some of the characteristics of post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, rates of who develops it vary. We think that only 10 to 20 percent of people who have been exposed to something traumatic actually go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder, which means that 80 to 90 percent of people who do experience something really traumatic don't go on to have this long-term um, event called PTSD. Sometimes you can have a short reactive period of time. If it's less than a month, it's called acute stress disorder as opposed, as opposed to post-traumatic stress disorder. But again, I, I don't want people to worry unnecessarily that if you have been exposed to something that was traumatic or deeply frightening or scary, that it's inevitable that you will go on to develop PTSD because that's not true. Um, we know that there are sort of pre and post trauma factors that correlate or help to predict the person's development of PTSD. Um, some of the pre trauma factors include um, education. So it appears that people with a higher education are somewhat protected from developing PTSD compared to those with a lower level of education. We know that previous trauma history might exacerbate or increase the likelihood that somebody goes on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we know that individuals who've had a history of um, trauma or childhood adversity are a little bit more developed um, 
prone to developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And we know that there's a link between a family psychiatric history and those who go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-trauma factors that might correlate with development of post-traumatic stress disorder um, include the trauma severity and how quickly it was resolved. So if it was like an acute event, like a car accident or a tornado that swept through and um, you know blew a house down, that event happens quickly, it's over quickly, the resolution might take some time, but the extent or the length of the traumatic experience itself is, is pretty short, and that tends to be less um, difficult or be less prone for somebody to develop PTSD than if there's something that's a longer lasting event, like being exposed to a war or um, if you've um, been in a domestic violence relationship for a long period of time. So the, the length and duration of the trauma after the initial start is predictive. Um, and also we know that social support is um, helps to predict whether or not people are going to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So that if there is more positive support for individuals after they've experienced something traumatic, there tends to be a reduction in the quality or the, the extent to which you might develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So having that strong support system and people who are very encouraging and supportive and believe in your trauma, that tends to bode well for not developing PTSD at all or having um, a, a more minor case post-traumatic stress disorder. We know that women tend to be at higher risk of de developing um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Some studies say twice as likely, um, but that also might be correlated with the fact that victims of interpersonal violence are more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And the literature tells us that women are more often going to be the um, victims of interpersonal violence. And that might be why they tend to have a higher rate of post-traumatic stress disorder. Again, the response of the first person to whom a trauma is reported is often predictive of how um, severe or whether or not a person um, develops post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's really important to, if somebody shares with you that something that has happened, to be very positive and supportive and encouraging of them. Or if you are somebody to whom something bad has happened, to be thoughtful and selective about how you share that with because you want to share it with somebody who's most likely to be supportive for you. All right. Let's go on and talk about diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Diagnosis requires that you have at least one symptom in each of these four areas or categories. So the first category is intrusion symptoms. Intrusion symptoms just mean that things come to you unrequested or unbidden, suddenly, unex unexpectedly. Those kinds of intrusion symptoms might be intrusive memories where you just keep thinking about and ruminating about something that happened. You might be having dreams about an event or nightmares. You might experience flashbacks where you actually feel like you're experiencing that traumatic event again, as though you're in, in the thick of it once more. Um, or you might experience real intense distress um, when you are exposed to things that remind you of or that are triggers for that particular event. And that intense distress can either be psychological, such as, you know, heightened anxiety or maybe feelings of panic, um, fear, depression, or they might be physiological, where you experience shortness of breath or feel your heart is racing or, you know, develop high blood pressure or you sweat a little bit. So um, having those intense distress reactions to exposure or something that reminds you of event would be um, one of those intrusion symptoms that we're talking about. A second category that you have to have at least one symptom, symptom of in order to be diagnosed with PTSD is avoidance of reminders of the events. So avoidance is trying to not remember any of the people or the places or the things or you know anything that was present during that traumatic event. So avoidance can be achieved through a number of strategies. Sometimes you try to numb out. Um, people numb out sometimes using alcohol or other drugs. A lot of times people use avoidance by just trying not to remember or we call it repression, just kind of squashing the memory so you don't have you know have to think about what occurred 
Um, sometimes people engage in sort of compulsive behaviors so that they are involved with those other behaviors so much that they don't have the time and energy to think about the traumatic event. Some of the avoidance behaviors that or compulsive behaviors you might see or excessive gambling or those kinds of things where you really get consumed with that event and, the, and they're doing, people are doing that in order not to think about what's traumatic. The third category of symptoms that you have to have at least one symptom from that category is long lasting negative changes in your thoughts, cognitive functioning and mood. So some of those long term negative changes might include really irrationally blaming yourself or other people for some traumatic event that happened, maybe feelings of guilt that are long lasting feelings of shame, anger, sometimes people feel a real flat mood. That flat mood is probably associated with avoidance of trying not to feel or remember anything. Um, sometimes people really are unable to experience anything positive in the world. So um, activities or gatherings or, or beloved people who formerly brought you joy, they don't bring you joy anymore. Those are some of those long lasting negative changes in your feelings. Changes in thoughts might be the, a belief that only bad things are going to happen, that the world is not a safe world, that nothing is ever going to get any better for you. Those are kind of the cognitive long-term changes that you might see in somebody with PTSD. Sometimes people develop something we call depersonalization, which is where you kind of feel detached from or outside of your own body, almost like you're an observer of your own body, but not involved necessarily in, in taking control of and driving the thoughts and actions of that body. Those e events aren't long term. They don't mean that you're um, seriously mentally ill. It's a common reaction to people who have developed post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but it's uncomfortable to experience that. It's one of the reasons people often come in for treatment. And another event that sometimes happens is something we call derealization, where people feel like they're completely detached from their surroundings. They feel surreal in them. The things don't feel real or things feel dreamlike and distorted. Again, that's not necessarily indicative of a different kind of serious psychopathology. Those are also symptoms common with people with post-traumatic stress disorder. And again, often the th things like that are what drive people to finally come in and get treatment. So um, the fourth category that you have to have at least one symptom of in order to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder is significant changes in arousal and reactivity. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, maybe heightened irritability, um, something we call hypervigilance, where you become very attuned to the environment. Every sound, you're wondering what that is, or you're always putting your back to the wall now and making sure that you can face doorways. Or if there's any kind of wind blowing, suddenly you begin to fear that it's that tornado again, and it triggers quite a lot of anxiety for you. People might develop an ex um, exaggerated startle response, where if somebody comes next to you when you didn't see them coming, you jolt, you're surprised. Um, sometimes that um, arousal reactivity is manifest in doing sort of reckless behaviors, um, destructive behaviors. You know, it might be driving your car as fast as you can because you're feeling so aroused or irritable, um, riding a motorcycle dangerously. Um, Symptoms also might include um, difficulty with sleep onset or sleep maintenance because you're always so um, keyed up and tense. Um, sometimes people describe difficulty with concentration. So those are some of the things that are symptoms consistent with that fourth category that is required in order for somebody to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. So let's talk about treatment. Um, treatment, the first line of treatment for PTSD is actually psychotherapy. There are different theories about what causes post-traumatic stress disorder, and the counseling treatments are evidence-based interventions that are techniques based on these theoretical underpinnings of how we understand post-traumatic stress disorder to develop and to be maintained. So one of the theories is a neurological, neurobiological one that talks about changes in brain structures and function that are created by the traumatic event and then sustain the traumatic reaction 
to that event that occurred. One of the big areas of change appears to be in an uh, organ part of the brain called the amygdala. Um, the amygdala is a brain structure made up of numerous small nuclei, and it appears that in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic event, it's hyperactivated, and it actually gets a little bit bigger. Um, and then afterward, it shrinks a little bit smaller than normal in people who haven't had a traumatic experience. Well, the function of the amygdala is to encode and create memories. So it helps us to learn new things and remember new things, but it's also um, tasked with purging unnecessary memories. And some of those unnecessary memories that need to be purged when we've experienced something traumatic is to let go of fearful stimuli or events that were present during the event, but that don't necessarily continue to cause danger to us. So for example, if you were in a car accident with a red car, that red car might be something that was encoded at the time as dangerous to you. But a red car isn't consistently dangerous. And so we need to teach the amygdala that all red cars are no longer dangerous. And so we don't have to go on to the, um, fear them anymore. The way the amygdala um, works is that we have to reteach it. It doesn't just forget. So reteaching the amygdala to have a different association with events that cause us to be traumatically activated is part of treatment. Another theory about what um, keeps PTS going is classic conditioning, and it's similar to what I just talked about. Classic conditioning is when one event happens and it's associated in time or place to something else, like I was driving and there was that red car, then the red car becomes conditioned to you thinking about um, all red cars being associated with something dangerous or bad. Or um, if you have been somebody who was assaulted by a man with a mustache, then it, we might associate or begin to conditionally, classically condition mustaches with danger that all men who have mustaches feel like they're a threat to you, when in fact we know that not all men with mustaches are a threat. So with classical conditioning, people are exposed to red cars or pictures of men with mustaches while being relaxed so that they no longer believe or feel irrationally that all red cars or all men with mustaches or white dogs or whatever it was that was the source of the trauma. So we learned that they're no longer dangerous to us and we don't have to get physiologically aroused every time we think see them. Um, another theory of um, what promotes and sustains post-traumatic stress disorder is a cognitive theory. And that is that there are negative thoughts that reinforce this trauma-based thinking. So some of those negative thoughts might be like, I deserve this or um, everything in the world is bad or there are no things to be hopeful about in the world or all people are only out for themselves and they're only gonna take advantage of me. Those kinds of persistent negative thoughts, um, they aren't accurate. And so part of therapy is trying to teach people um, to rethink some of those negative beliefs and um, learn new positive ways of thinking so that they're not reinforcing that trauma-based view of the world anymore and being stuck in believing that only bad things happen to them. Um, a fourth theory about what sustains post-traumatic stress disorder is an emotional processing theory. And with this theory, it, it talks about this fear, the fear that we have about something, we've learned to fear something because something bad happened to us, is that fear creates a constant vigilant about that thing. Um, and it maintains anxiety every time we're exposed to it. And so we try to expose people to that which they are fearful of in a calm, in a safe, in a relaxed setting after we've taught them to relax well, we overteach the relaxation response when we do therapy so that they no longer feel that emotional arousal and that fear when they think about or exposed to or see whatever it was that has triggered their memory and their recall of something traumatic that happened to them. Post-traumatic stress disorder is maintained by avoidance of memories, avoidance of places or people or other things that were associated with the trauma. So therapy 
safely helps the client talk about these triggers or those things so that they learn not to fear them anymore. So treatment goals. When in treatment, we're going to confront traumatic memories and when talking about them or having pictures of them or remembering in depth of those traumatic details of things that were, were experienced in the past, when that exposure happens and nothing bad happens to the client in, in, the, in the counseling setting, then the client slowly learns not to fear those things anymore. What this does is it breaks that conditioned anxiety and fear connection so that things that are no longer a threat no longer trigger fear. That person no longer has to fear every red car, no longer has to fear every man with a mustache, no longer has to fear every large white dog like the one that attacked them when they were a child, something like that. Um, the client in the course of treatment experiences changes in their beliefs about the world and about their vulnerability in the world. And that helps them create optimism and more hopefulness. Um, the client, uh, most of these therapies are narrative therapies, which means that you're doing a lot of talking, a lot of talking about that, these things that happen. In the course of talking and retelling the story and then retelling the story again and again with these changing reactions to events and these changing beliefs about the world, the client begins to create a new life story that makes peace with the past helps them move forward with less anger, helps them move forward with less blame and guilt and fear and sadness and avoidance. Um, so those are the treatment goals for psychotherapy. We also know that in the process of the psychotherapy um, interactions that sometimes patients need additional support in order to manage the anxiety or the guilt or the um, depression that they're experiencing while they are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. And so it's very common for us to be working collaboratively with a psychiatric team um, where medications can be prescribed to treat the anxiety and to treat the depression um, so that it's easier actually for patients to tolerate the therapy because it can feel intense to be invited to confront and square off with something that you've been avoiding for a long time because of such strong fear. So we often work collaboratively with psychiatrists to help take the edge off or some of the pain out of those memories through medication um, in order to achieve our treatment goals. We also know that there are some medications that are available to help reduce the frequency of nightmares. And that's often, again, a really important adjunct to treatment with post-traumatic stress disorder. So we know that people who are in the midst of ongoing traumatic events um, don't really benefit well from um, treatment. So for example, if I'm working with somebody who's been the victim of domestic violence and that domestic violence is continuing, um, treatment is not gonna work until we are able to get that person out of an unsafe situation. So one of the early steps in treat, treat, treating post-traumatic stress disorder is assessing the patient's ongoing safety and freedom from the very thing that they're trying to move forward from. Um, and if they're in a circumstance where they're not safe, where they're not free of ongoing stressors similar to what we're treating, then we do a lot of problem solving in order to help that person get out of that. Um, and once they're free of those ongoing um, traumatic events that continue to tr struggle or to trouble them, then we're able to help them move forward. So that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, I hope this is helpful. It's important for you to um, know how to be a responsive, supportive person if someone comes to you with a traumatic event and to know where to refer yourself or somebody else. Um, if you have been exposed to something traumatic and you believe that you've developed post-traumatic stress disorder. So again, my name is Linda Helmick. I'm a psychologist at KSB. Um, the number for our clinic is there on the screen. You can call 815-285-5636 to schedule an appointment. We um, work in an outpatient setting with, um, as a team with psychiatrists and counselors. And um, we work with a lot of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, have a good rest of your evening and thank you for joining in. Goodbye. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Akhil Khan, and I help support our telehealth operations here at KSB. Our motto is right care, right place, right time. If you believe you're dealing with a post-traumatic stress situation, the tool we're going to show today will help determine what the right care is for you. The right place is wherever you're at, as long as you have internet connection. And the right time is whenever you need it. So not nine to five like a traditional doctor's office, but our tool is available 24-7. So let's go ahead and get into it. We're over here on ksbhospital.com. You'll notice the virtual care link in the upper right-hand corner. When you select the virtual care link, this is also a name for telehealth, you'll come to our landing page. Over here, you're gonna to come to our KSB Care Anywhere televisits. Again, these are available 24 seven. And you'll notice that new, we've added brain health screenings available for depression, anxiety, ADHD, post-traumatic stress, and substance use concerns. So when I select get care now, I'm gonna to come to our landing page, K, uh, KSB Care Anywhere. I'll select login. If you haven't already, please go ahead and create an account. It only takes a few minutes. Once you're in, you'll select what patient you are. You can add your dependents as well and do a visit on their behalf. I'm over here on the brain health tab. You'll notice that these visits are completely free because we realize the importance of brain health, especially in this pandemic era with COVID. And our clinician hours are available 24 seven. So I'll go ahead and select start a new visit. You'll make sure that uh, you'll select what state you're in if you have a PCP and consent to the terms and privacy policy. We want to quickly uh, ensure that you're not having any serious conditions. So you'll say no to the emergency situation if that is true. And then over here, we're going to select the brain health drop down and you'll see all the different conditions that we have screening tools for. You'll come down over to traumatic experience. You'll hit select and you'll begin your visit. These visits take anywhere from a minute or less, and they'll ask you questions about the event in, of concern or any thoughts or feelings about the event. When you're done, you can go ahead and submit your visit, and a member of our care team will reach out to you with next steps. We're excited to offer this tool, and we hope that you find benefit from it. Thank you, and have a great day.